very much. We're going to keep with the atherectomy theme and uh, move on to TurboHawk atherectomy, why, when, and how. Dr. Kusro Niazi from Emory University. Thank you very much, Sahil uh, Sopesh. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for doing a phenomenal job on this conference. Uh, uh, congratulations on a very successful uh, format. So my presentation is just going to be my experience. So I'm just going to share my experience. And I think these are different options. My suggestions to people who are doing that get good with some device, something that you feel comfortable. And once you are good with that, uh, there's no head-to-head -head comparison. So I don't think so we can say that any one device is better than the other. Atherosclerosis is so complex with multiple factors affecting. I mean, at least for me, I don't know if one device has been shown clearly to address that. This is just how I think when I see lesions. Uh, if I want to get uh, maximum lumen gain, the device that I feel comfortable with is directional atherectomy because in most other devices, I don't get the maximum lumen gain. If I have to treat eccentric disease, I can go over there, direct my cutter, and take care of that. For severe calcium, I don't think so directional works very well, though they have a calcium cutter. But I think over there, my choice is orbital atherectomy. If I'm treating soft, moderate plaque, then I think the directional laser and rotational, any one of those will work fine. And restoring inline flow or treating circumferential disease, I think all these uh, devices will work. But get comfortable with a few devices and I make a strategy. When I pick directional, if there's no calcium or mild to moderate calcium, my choice is going to be directional. I personally do not believe in stenting below the inguinal ligament. So I don't have much stent-free stenosis because I rarely stent below the inguinal ligament. And I will go in with the atherectomy device and many times, I would say at least 70 to 80% of the time, will do adjunctive chocolate balloon. My evolution with drug-coated balloon has been very interesting in the past 12 to 18 months. We were enrolled in the trials when they were being done. After the trials, when the balloons became available, I started thinking initially that in de novo lesion, should I hold off on the drug-coated balloon? Because every lesion that I treat with chocolate and turbohawk atherectomy, they don't reach the nose. So since I don't know which ones will reach the nose, why should I expose all the patients to a drug? Over time, I've started treating more drug, uh, lesions which are complex lesions with drug-coated balloon on the first go-around. So I'm still evolving and sharing my thinking. Most of you probably are familiar with the Hawk One cutter, which uh, comes in. I think the important thing for users to know is the nose cone. I mean, because if you are, uh, most of the time you're going to use a filter. Remember, the LX has a longer nose cone as compared to the S. And then you can also take a Hawk One and treat many of the SFAs with, uh, through a six front sheet. You don't have to put a seven front sheet. But obviously, if your SFA is large, six, seven millimeter vessel, you will need the large device. So for common femoral, I'm always using a seven French device with an LS cutter because it, the plaque is more focalized, but the vessel is so big that I need a bigger cutter. SFA, depending on the vessel size, I'm picking uh, the cutting device. And then for popliteal artery, it's always a six French sheath with the H1M uh, cutter. And below the knee, it's always the small cutter. Before, we used to have the SXC, but the terminology has not changed. Always using distal protection devices. Sometimes, I think when I get lazy, when it's a restenotic lesion and it's focal lesion, I probably will skip uh, distal. So I won't spend too much time in history. I just want to share some cases that the lesions I just told you how I've treated them, you can see over here that this is the common femoral artery on the right side. And on an, uh, without the subtraction over there, you can see on the angiogram run, and then you can have the cutter. You can bring in the cutter contralaterally very nicely, and you can take care of the lesion. And this lesion was just done with the atherectomy, so no adjunctive balloon. This was before the drug-coated balloons were available. And I've had good results in common femoral. I only send them for endotrectomy if it's heavily, densely calcified, and the patient is not too obese, so the uh, surgical risk of infection and healing would be uh, much better. So this is another patient with claudication. Again, you can see on the left screen over here that there is involving the ostium of the profunda and the SFA calcified lesion, not heavily calcified. As I said, for heavy calcium, I will go for an orbital device, and you can do a threctomy and take care. You can cut across the profunda ostium without any fear of losing that branch. This is, uh, again, an osteal SFA disease. I find for osteum SFA, it's perfect. I don't have to worry about landing a stent perfectly at the osteum, not jailing the profunda. I can take this device and keep shaving the osteum till I get the osteum to the perfect size. This is a patient with the right SFA, was treated with atherectomy and adjunctive balloon angioplasty, chocolate balloon, and this was the final result over there. 
This is another patient who has diffuse disease of the SFA up to the mid-segment. You can see the distal SFA popliteal below the knee and all the way down, posterior tibial artery going down. We did RAO LAO projection. Sometimes in LAO projection, you can find the nubbin over there, and then you can go ahead and cross that lesion and uh, put a distal protection device. You can see that on the right side. And once the distal protection device has been deployed over there, you can come in with the atherectomy device. You can start shaving over there. Once you get your plaque close to less than 30%, you can do adjunctive balloon angioplasty. And this is a long vascular tract balloon because, unfortunately, chocolate does not come anything longer than 120. I wish they would make that. That would be great. And this is after doing adjunctive balloon angioplasty. Again, was not treated with a... Because of time, I'm going to skip this. This is critical limb ischemia. This is below the knee. No named vessels can be identified. There is peroneal artery can distal, a mid to distal segment is identified, but it's occluded right after the uh, uh, little origin of the anterior tibial, which is 100% occluded. This was recanalized and establishing good flow, and the wound healed up. This is again being all done with directional atherectomy. So you can take care of these lesions. This is the last case over here, which you can see the anterior tibial artery is diseased, the distal popliteal artery is diseased, and then in the mid-segment, the anterior tibial artery is 100% occluded, and you can see the distal runoff over there, severely diseased anterior tibial artery. We were able to recanalize this anterior tib and this is an injection on the right side with a catheter once we cross. I always cross CTOs, and I always take a distal injection to make sure that I'm in the true lumen and also define the distal anatomy. This is the SS cutter coming across the ostium of the, if you're careful, you can do it without any perforation, but you just have to be careful because the vessel bending around, but it can safely be done. And this is the result after treating that and adjunctive balloon angioplasty. I would say in my experience, 70 to 80% of the time after directional atherectomy, I do adjunctive balloon angioplasty, and the balloon of choice is my chocolate balloon. Thank you very much.